Good evening, everybody. My name is Brian O'Connor. I'm a Kevin Harrington Student Ambassador here at the Institute of Politics. Thank you guys for coming out here tonight. Uh, and on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics, I'd like to welcome you all. The Institute's mission is to educate, engage, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic and political life and to strengthen democracy. And the Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse any political issues or candidates. Before we begin this program, I'd just like to remind everybody to please turn off their cell phones or any other devices that make noise. <clears throat> Tonight's event, which is part of our Ethics in Government series, Market Basket, Inside a Historic Corporate and Government Crisis, will feature a panel discussion on the 2014 Market Basket Employee Strike. The leading our panel is Dr. Daniel Cushman, <coughs> Associate Professor of Marketing at Drexel University and author of We Are Market Basket. So without further ado, Two people were the most up. 
We don't take direction from people outside. Just because the board gives them the CEO title, my boss is not the Holes. Always will be. I can't even say that I was thought I was at the head of a labor movement at that point. I really didn't expect this thing to last more than a week. The daily saga of the unassuming band of rebels behind it would captivate the nation. These people are here to just destroy what we spent our entire lives doing, all these people we talked with. They've all been here since they were 16, 14 years old. When we heard that there were two new CEOs that were being brought in to take this place over, it was just foolish. These guys are going to come in and they think they're the boss. Good luck to them. They're going to need workers to do the work because we're not going to be here. Armed only with loyalty, dogged determination, and virtually no knowledge of the workings of labor disputes, their accomplishments would confound business leaders, economists, and academics. They wouldn't break the rules regarding labor disputes. They would rewrite them. They wouldn't create a mere distraction for a $4 billion corporation. They would bring it to its knees. Really, there was no other option, and there was no other way to go. This was it. It was either Akhati Demoulos as president, CEO, running this company with his management team, or it's over. And where most walkouts are about long lists of often complex demands, this one was about something very simple. What we want is market basket, and what we want is our old CEO back, the one who did it all right from the beginning. How do you help this place? This is their story. followed it along ever ever since uh, he has mountains of footage nine terabytes <laughs> that's our last count uh, and more than anyone else that he's uh, he's encountered in the documentary field uh, just tremendous footage and right in the center of uh, this crisis you know directors uh, of corporate boards they are now facing more scrutiny than they have at any time in the past. Mostly these directors, they're under scrutiny from shareholders. Shareholders are asking them to act on their behalf. Sometimes at the expense of other stakeholders of the company. Tonight what we're gonna hear about, and we're gonna see more of the film, uh, which I'm always excited to see, we're gonna hear about uh, a case where a group of shareholders and a divided board, they came up against a group so formidable that it almost took down this company just a year and a bit ago. It is an eye-opening event, I think, for anyone who studies business, particularly those who are interested in corporate governance, uh, which is one angle of this that has been, uh, I think, understudied. I'm a professor of business, I'm a fellow of the, uh, our Center for uh, Corporate Governance. Um, the film said that, it, that this case confounded many academics, and I'm one of those uh, who looks at business completely differently now than, than I ever did before. Uh, so we've got um, Jay Childs, who's uh, sitting in, in the middle here. We have uh, Cindy Whalen, who is the store director of the Epping Market Basket. She uh, has a staff of over 500 employees. Um, she was uh, 
uh, has a very unique place in this, uh, which I'll, I'll let her get into in a, in a few minutes, but she has a story to tell that uh, you won't believe. Jim Fantini, he's a vendor. Uh, he supplies the private label bakery products uh, to Market Basket. <coughs> He is not a, um, on the payroll of Market Basket. He's not an official employee uh, in that sense, but you won't find a more dedicated person to Market Basket than Jim Fantini. Uh, and he is, was, is also a central player in this, in this protest. I'll give you a quick one minute history because I want to get to the, to the panel right away. Uh, Market Basket started in 1917 in Lowell, started by Arthur T's <coughs> grandparents. Athanasios and Ephrosine de Moulis. The business was built up in, in large part by their two sons, uh, Mike and George. Uh, George, who passed away in the, in the 70s, uh, Mike, who died in the early 2000s. Uh, when, um, in, the, in the 2000s, when this crisis was about to hit, we had uh, warring factions of the family tend to use Arthur T. on one side as a shorthand for that side of the family, descendants of Mike, who were heavily off the, uh, involved in the operations of the company, and then Arthur S.'s side of the family. Arthur S. has become a sort of shorthand for that whole side of the family who were uh, not involved in the operations of the company, but really took much more of a, a shareholder uh, perspective. Uh, at a certain point, uh, the, the thing that the catalyst for this crisis was Rafaela Evans, uh, Arthur S.'s sister-in-law, uh, who began voting on the Arthur S. side, uh, began voting for shares for, for that side. That led to a revamping of the board, where board members were replaced, and it became a board that was heavily divided, five against two. Five people on Arthur S.'s side, uh, on Arthur S's side uh, two people on uh, Arthur T. side who uh, were selected by him. <coughs> This board accused Arthur T. of uh, being belligerent, of uh, related party transactions, of the uh, uh, financial mismanagement when he reimbursed the losses uh, that uh, the pension fund incurred as a result of the 2008 crisis, uh, and ultimately resulted in his firing. Let's go back to 2013. Uh, Jay, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, the early days how you, you came to on, upon this project? Well, if I know now what I know then, <laughs> um, I was looking for uh, a new idea for film projects. So um, one of my friends was at the time an assistant store manager, and we were out having a beer. And they said, you know, you really ought to do a story on the Dumoulis family and the market basket business. That's a fascinating story, and it was anyways. And so I'd grown up with Market Basket. You know, I knew some of the history vaguely, uh, that, that there was friction between factions of the family. But then you had this, you know, clean, low-price, friendly supermarket on this side, and sort of the family turmoil on this side. And I thought about it. I'm like, this was worth kind of diving in and doing some research and, and figuring it out. And very early on, I, cult, I started to sort of cultivate sources and trying to learn the story. And I was told, like, you know, almost like hot off the presses, there's been a shift here. There's been a, a, a tremor. And I had assumed that things were always kind of in a state of unrest. But what I was told was things had been relatively quiet for quite a while, but that what was happening right now could <clears throat> impact the viability and the future of the company, like right off the bat. And so I was like, well, I'm in. Um, and it was when I went to a uh, rally in Waltham. This is before Arthur T. was fired, where, and that's where I met Cindy. Um, where they were essentially protesting the fact that a, uh, a store that was set to be finished, completed, and opened was mothballed for a period of time. 
and uh, Cindy was up on the on a flatbed truck. I mean, this, this this took me back to like things I'd seen in like the '50s about people with bullhorns up on flatbed trucks, you know. And uh, she was talking to this crowd, and she stopped in mid sentence. He's here. And Arthur T got out of the car. And I just put my camera over my head, and it was somewhere between a rock star and a papal visit, with people just, the, the crowd just converged on him. And I'm noticing that he's like grabbing these people, and he knows their names, and they're just responding to this person in a way that I had never seen pretty much with anybody else. And that was really the day between the events and just that connection. I'm like, that's it. I'm in. I'm, I'm following this wherever it goes. And having no idea, honestly, that it would like blow up like this. But that one source had told me this is something wholly different than anything that's happened before. And this is a full year before the yep. before the, this, uh, the walkout and the boycott. Exactly, exactly. So, but there were all, and that's, and, and you know, you've talked about it before. That's one of the myths was that this took place essentially over a summer in six weeks, and it didn't. It was festering for an entire year before that as well. What do you see? You, what have you learned about Market Basket that surprised you over the uh, over this past couple of years? Um that I, I'm naturally kind of a skeptic. I don't really, you know, and, and when I honestly, when I first saw what was going on at that Waltham rally, I'm like, man, I don't know. I just, people who seem that devoted, you know, I always say it, being a New Englander, you know, don't trust anybody who's like happy all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this was just the, the, the purest distilling of loyalty and commitment and, and mission that I'd seen in a corporate environment, juxtaposed with the fact that I work with a lot of clients of big companies and small companies, and one of them recently sent me an email saying, just so you know, my email has changed. We got bought out by some company in Europe. I don't even know who or who our CEO is. And you know, most people lift their heads up for a minute, and they kind of look around, they make sure they still have a job, and then they go back to work. And here was a group that said, no, like, no. And I never, you know, that just blew my mind. <laughs> and it started, as, uh, as he says, in 2013. That's right around um, the time when, uh, when Jim Fantini really started to become active in this protest. Um, can you tell us about some of the, the earlier days about that time that, that people don't really associate with this protest? Sure. It, it, um, it was in July, early July of 2013 that the word really got out that this board had flipped and um, the culture of Market Basket that we'd all grown up with, the, the company the, and the leadership of the, the company was in jeopardy. It was not just jeopardy, but it, in real fact was about to be turned on its ear and, and Arthur T was about to be fired. You know, the great thing about being here tonight and that this is about corporate governance is a lot of people now know through the book, your wonderful book, and um, the, the documentary, as well as all the news clips, that you know, there were two sides of the family that had, had different ways of looking at this company. One side walked the walk, talked the talk, built it, and worked it every day, and the other side looked at it as, a, as an asset, uh, as a means to uh, be on the sidelines and, and create tremendous wealth. And then the people who came up and saved the company, but the, uh, none of the story would have happened if there weren't um, three independent, quote unquote, board members who came along. And despite everything we tried to do, every sign we told them, every um, petition, every website, every letter, email from a store manager who might be up on this panel, um, they ignored everything for a, a, an agenda that was put in front of them which said, we need to create this asset, we need to create as, as much at, uh, wealth as we can from it, and everybody else be damned. We want to, we want to sell this company or whatever they might want to do. And um, it's, it's great to talk about these men because as much as we were happy to see them leave our lives, we can't forget them. And they were named Keith Cowan, Ron Wiener, and Eric Chabady. And 
you know, when I think people talk about the, the bank crisis and everybody skated back uh, almost a decade ago, these guys were that for us. This company, this region was in jeopardy. And um, as we'll talk about, I guess, tonight, they played a huge role and could have done so much to stop what ended up happening. Uh, but unknowingly, they would play a huge role in making this company probably better than it ever has been and never will, would have been if they did not come out and do what they did. So early in July, we found out that this was going to happen. And we didn't know how many people felt the same way we did, but Tom Trainer, who you saw up there, and myself um, said, let's start a petition. And we hoped for a couple hundred people to get involved. And by the board meeting, which was six days later, we had 45,000 people sign the online petition, and we had over 200,000 customers sign petitions in the stores. So we realized that there was an army of people here who identified with this company, identified with the culture of the company, and were going to do whatever they could to have some say in this fight. And we didn't know what that was, but we knew somehow we need to keep the beat of these people alive and keep everybody invested in the fight to see what we could do. And we had no idea if we would go to a good place, a bad place, but we just knew that one way or another, we we're going to try to make ourselves heard. I can imagine a lot of people, maybe even some people in the audience tonight, who would say, you're a vendor. You're selling bread to this company, right? I mean, how, how, did, how in the world did you get involved in, in this massive protest? How did you end up in, in the center of it, number one? But more importantly, like, how could you be so committed to this? Well, see, Daniel, you obviously don't go to the, the Facebook website of We Are Market Basket because it says associates, customers, and vendors. We are all Market Basket. So, um, yeah, it's, it's unusual for a vendor to get so involved, but my family uh, has been a part of the Market Basket um, community since the early 60s when my dad, uh, who was the second, third generation of Painting and Baking Company, it struck up a relationship with Market Basket. And um, you know it was a great two-way street relationship. When my dad's business was in jeopardy in the late '70s, Market Basket could have certainly said, "You know, you're a weak supplier now. You've hit Chapter 11, and it's time for us to go a different direction." But they looked at him as somebody who helped them build their business, as a business partner, and as a part of their family. And so, had they made just a strictly business decision, they probably would have gone in a different direction. But that's not how this company's run. And you know, that simple decision meant so much for my family. And our family is not a one off on that. There's so many other businesses and small businesses who have grown into what they are thanks to Market Basket. So it was very easy for me on a personal level from uh, my family's business. And it was very easy for me just being a part of the Market Basket community to step up and say, what can I do here? And there was this real danger that Arthur T. would, would lose his job, be fired in 2013. He was ultimately saved uh, for a while from that. Uh, what, what do you think would have, would have happened had the company lost him permanently? I mean, what was at stake here for the company and for the, for the, for the way that you did business um, and the way that you led your life? I think everything was. This whole community, if you think about, uh, you know, I can't do the math on the whole thing, but if they say the average customer, the family of four, saves around $4,000 a year by shopping at Market Basket versus the competition. Well, we have 2 million customers. Let's, let's uh, do that math over uh, a year as to what it would have meant to the community and to the vendors and to the associates. Had we become part of, and I say we because again, I'm not a vendor, but I'm part of Market Basket. Had we become part of an international conglomerate, which we've seen happen with Hannaford, so it was always a great competitor and still is, but to do business with them, my company, LePage, does business with them and used to have a relationship similar to Market Basket. It's become part of Del Hayes, which was a very real suitor in this game, and it looked like they were going to be the ones to buy this company. Mm -hmm. It's no longer the same. Our company has suffered tremendously because of the fact that Hannaford has become a Wall Street company, an international conglomerate, where the personal relationship doesn't mean much anymore between vendor and, and buyer and company and company. So it was a very real, scary thing that was set off simply by grief. And the other, you mentioned surprises, a, a couple of the surprises that dovetailed off of that, and I, and I say this with affection. Um, it surprised me in some ways how ill-equipped they were 
to pull this off at first. Because first of all, getting an online petition up, uh, you know, Tom says it himself, he didn't know how to put up a Facebook page. Like he didn't, he said, I don't know a wall from a window from a, you know, whatever. And uh, so to harness, you know, social media and get the message out that way, when this is a company that doesn't have a website and still prints a paper circular, you know, for all of the stores. The other thing was, that surprised me was, you know, people know this script now. So even though people lift their heads up and then they go back to work, when a company is acquired, they know, what, they know what's coming. They know that there's going to be layoffs and they just hope they're not one of them. But, but we know how this plays out. And there was this presenting of the idea that nothing's going to change, we're still the market basket, and there was sort of a faction, I think, within the company that knew that this could be bad, but weren't sure what it was going to mean. Like, I don't know what this is going to mean, but it's unsettling. And then there was another faction that absolutely, pretty much from day one, knew what this was going to mean. Um, and it wasn't a matter of playing it out and finding out. It was a matter of, we know exactly where this is going, and we're not going to let it. But we're going to try to stop it. Cindy Whalen, from the, from the store perspective, um, you know, you've got the, the board making these decisions. What, how, how, what were you seeing at this time? Try to, maybe you can try to help us feel what it was like to be in your shoes in 2013 when this is starting to ramp up. It was very unsettling. Um, you go from having your CEO that you know and knows you and your, and your family. Um, I think to see Mr. Trainer and Mr. Fantini um, nervous, I got nervous um, because these are two of the strongest men I know, and um, to see them actually apprehensive and knowing that this was not good and it was not going to turn out well should it um, should it happen. What were you worried about at like at your store with that? What would happen if if the board had succeeded that first time? Or do you remember what you were uh, what, how you, how it would have changed the way that you did business and overseeing that store? I do. Um, I remember just, A, I know that the workflow was probably would have been minimalized as it usually is. I know the prices would have went up. Keeping my customers uh, with the best prices was going to be a serious issue. Customer service, which we're known for, was going to pay um, deeply. Um, I think that is what makes Market Basket Market Basket is the personal relationship we have with our customers. And if you cut down your workforce to make, to raise the margins and, and create more revenue for the shareholders, if that becomes your focus, it, it really does hinder um, every, our culture, basically. It's in jeopardy. Now, with, with these concerns you had, you did something that would not occur to most people, uh, and most people would not have the nerve to do, uh, and that was to begin correspondence with members of the board. Can you tell us about, about some of that? Like, how did you decide to, to start this? What, what, were you, what were you hoping to, to do when you sent your first email to the board members? I think I was just reaching out and trying to get in there. I'm, I'm one of those people that, even though I'm loyal to my company, I want to know both sides of the story. I like being educated. I like being well-rounded. Um, so I did reach out. I reached out to every single board member. Well, except for ours. I didn't have to worry about where they stood. Um, and the shareholders. I didn't, I didn't stop at just the, the board members. I reached out. Even sent probably, I think, four letters overseas. Because it's the only way you can get in touch with Raphael Evans is snail mail. So, and it cost a dollar ten to send it over, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I reached out and I, I did get one uh, response back. I think multiple people did from El uh, Nabil El Haj, who um, at the time was on the board of directors, and it was just a pretty professional and status quo response, um, very generic and you know and, and polite. Um, and then he, we, um, we, what, a month or two later, he resigned from the board anyway. So, um, and then it took about three months before 
uh, I got a new best friend, um, Mr. Ron Weaver. Um, uh, he, he and I exchanged probably, on average, give or take, we got mad at each other a lot. We were like a married couple when we thought we didn't teach speak to each other. But on average, it was about five times a week. Um, and there were multiple email exchanges on a daily basis sometimes. Magic and a test form because I would laugh at uh, my office a lot. But so it was very personal. Him and I got really um, personal. So let's uh, give an idea of, of the um, of the sort of progression of these email exchanges. You have uh, the, the early ones were what, what were you talking about? What, what were you writing about? The early ones I was writing about um, why they shouldn't change Dr. Chen, the structure. Um, benefits, um, just the basic knowledge, uh, raised margins, um, and he would always reach for back with, you know, um, your status quo, um, you don't know what you're talking about, none of that's going to happen, and wages was another issue, um, don't affect the workers, they're the hard blood of the, the company, they're the ones on the front lines taking care of your customers. And he's a, he always spoke at what I call um, smoke and mirrors and double talk. He would always give just the right amount of verbiage to kind of deny what I was saying and saying I was accusatory of him. But then three months later, he did exactly that. And he would always go, well, no, see, I told you at the time we weren't talking about that. But see, now it's changed. So, And he always did that. He was very condescending. And, um, Oh, what's the other word? Aggressive, sometimes. And towards the, towards the end of those uh, of those exchanges, what were what were those like? The very end, it was um, he was really attacking a lot of people on a personal level. Um, he was attacking um, the website and the Facebook page. He was attacking um, Apatit Moors. He was attacking Phil Martin um, and Joe Rockwell. He wanted me to read court documents from 1990, and have I read them? And if I did, did it change my opinion on those people? And I told him I read those court documents back in 2000 or 1997, I think was the original <coughs> decision. Um, and it, I don't need a court document to um, make a judgment on somebody's character, because I look at them in the face. I know their character. Um, so it got really personal and uh, ugly, you know, the infamous shut up email. That's what I call it, the shut up email. So I can, I can read a, a short excerpt from it where uh, Cindy Whalen writes to Ron Weiner, says, uh, you lied to me about profit sharing repeatedly, I might add. I'm very upset with you. That's just uh, uh, one portion of it that she goes on. Uh, he writes back, Cindy, Please feel encouraged to show me the email where you think I've lied regarding the profit sharing program. And if you cannot, please apologize and shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Best regards. Right? <laughs> Best regards. Um, she wrote back and, and quoted uh, two emails of his, one on January 12th and March 3rd, uh, about, about uh, statements that he was making about that. About that. We have some, uh, there were some other emails. She wasn't the only person. This was part of, uh, I don't know, you, you couldn't really call it a campaign because it wasn't coordinated or, or in any way, but, uh, but it was certainly the campaign in the sense that it was constant and it was coming from a lot of people, right? Uh, Scott Padnode is another, another person who had similar correspondence. Uh, he wrote at one point, he was, he was a little bit more, uh, I, I think, uh, aggressive in his, in his dealing with-, with uh, And with he's the people. Burlington meat manager, he's, meat he's, manager. Not, he's not a store manager, he's yeah, a meat he's manager. A, he's a meat manager in Burlington. He wrote, uh, Ron, uh, for someone as educated as yourself, I expected something a little bit better. Your compensation committee has had a great effect on my ability to provide for my family. If it's more carpetbaggers that fly in for a check, I think I have a right to know. In my opinion, you and this board can't see the trees through the forest. And then uh, Ron Wiener writes back 20 minutes later, uh, so you can get a sense of how quickly he was responding to some of these things. Uh, Dear Scott, thank you for your thoughts. Once again, you demonstrate your misinformed, biased ignorance. <laughs> By the way, the expression is, can't see the forest through the trees. Bye, Ron. 
there's another one, uh, another exchange. We're not, we're not going away, and we're looking forward to the announcement that you have resigned your, your position on the board. Have a great day. Uh, that's from Scott. <laughs> And then uh, Ron Wiener responds within six minutes this time. Uh, Thanks for being the gratuitously obnoxious person you continue to be. Have a great day, Ron. <laughs> uh, so this Very is constructive. <laughs> this is a, it's a contentious uh, battle here. But I mean, at, at the end of it, I mean, these, these emails, they seem comical now. Uh, but at the time, I mean, this is uh, something where you're, uh, you know, I mean, you're, you're a manager. These, this is a board that has control over your job. What, did, what was your takeaway in the sense of where, where was this board going? I mean, did you have any doubt what they wanted to do? No, not a one. I knew ultimately what their goal was. Um, early on, I just thought that uh, ASD wanted to sit in ATD's seat in the, in the big office, you know, and, and pound on the desk. But, um, you know, as you tend to educate yourself as stuff unfolds, I knew um, that they were planning to sell this company, get, get as much, liquidate as much of the assets as they could, and, and sell the company to the highest bidder and take it away from uh, the CEOs. Um, I think there was, yes, monetary gain um, for the other side of the family was definitely the primary goal, but taking away something that um, people would love so much was like a goal um, that really was it's interesting as Cindy says this because our, our education it was really a crash course in what was going on here because this company forever had gone to the top of its game by being insulated from everything that was happening in the boardroom and the family dynamics to a large degree we all knew that there was I mean you know, coming from a family business myself we knew that there was uh, there's always a, a struggle in family business and when this board flipped, um, you know, we got that news, and then we found out that as the, the board had flipped, you know, Arthur S. had played his hands to some degree by the, sh the shareholders on his side by looking, they had laid out the groundwork for firing Arthur by saying he had uh, recklessly spent money. And that, if you recall, uh, in the story, that $46 million that the company lost in its profit sharing plan, Arthur S. accused him of reckless spending by repaying all of the hard working men and women whose profit sharing and retirement that was. He took it out of the profits of the shareholders, and so Arthur S. looked at that as reckless. So, stakeholders, thank you, you said it correctly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then they, they said he was too much cap, capital expenditures, and which was taking the profits and building new stores in different communities and helping the economy and helping everybody win. Um, there, there were the, the profit sharing plan as well he wanted to revamp. So these, all these reasons they looked at, he laid the groundwork, and when this new board came in, they saw that and said, okay, you know, they probably figuring the role of a board member is to help these shareholders do what they want, and these guys want the assets, then great. That's where we kind of came in. Now suddenly we realized they were going to fire this guy, turn the company on its ear, and these three gentlemen, we went on this crusade to try to say, all right, we needed to plead with them because once they learned out who, the, who we are to make up this company and what this company means to everybody, certainly they'll say, whoa, wait a second, there's more here than just this, you know, one side of the story. And Arthur S. and his side now, they just own 50.5% of the company. And Arthur T. and his side own 49.5%. So you would think a principal board member, an independent board member would come in and say, you know, that's only a 1% delta. So on the 49.5%, they've built this company that is the lowest prices, almost nationwide, is the highest in bottom line profit. I mean, how do you strike that balance in this world to be the best on the prices for the consumer and be the best at the bottom line? So everybody's winning. The vendors, the shareholders have this enormous asset from which they'd taken hundreds of million dollars in the previous decade, as we've all you know, heard through varying sources. So an independent board member, you would think, would have a responsibility to say, let's step back. There's thousands of people out here at our first board meeting. There's thousands and hundreds of thousands who have signed a petition. 
we got to kind of figure out what's going on. But as we soon realized, they weren't principled. These men came in to enact that agenda. Everybody else be damned. And that's that's pretty daunting if you think about what their what their agenda was. And you know, uh, the definition of the word mercenary, if you look it up, is to do something for money rather than for ethics. And so I think these men, your friend Ron Wiener, Eric Jabati, and Keith Cowan were the very addition of uh, definition of that, in my opinion. Well, certainly what, what we saw was uh, that they were not responding to, uh, to these calls from vendors, from store managers, uh, in many cases from customers, although I'm not aware of customers that contacted them directly, but they could still hear the voices through the media, through these protests. Um, that didn't happen in 2014. Uh, 2014 uh, this is the part of the story that we as, uh, as New Englanders are much more familiar with because this is the story that hit the front pages of every newspaper uh, and, uh, and the first five minutes of every news program uh, for that period of time. Um, we're going to take a, a look at another clip mm -hmm. uh, called uh, from a scene called Shut It Down. Shut It Down. Would you like to introduce it? Sure. This takes place uh, right in the aftermath of the uh, firing of Arthur T, the installation of, and others, uh, the installation of two new CEOs, and it was sort of a three week about um, respite, and then they decide, as you saw in the prologue, to walk out. Um, at first, there's a sense that we're walking out. What do we do now? And then the idea kind of came to fruition of we're going to save the company by starving the company. We're going to save the company by almost destroying the company, by shutting it down and not um, supplying the stores um, and basically drive it to its knees. And so this is kind of encapsulates what happened. Great. Let's take a look. We have two million devoted customers that have got our back. We have 25,000 associates against five directors and two incompetent CEOs. Tremendously formulated plans, all right? This happened now, we're going to do this tomorrow. No, no, no. Not in my case, anyway. Rules of the road of general labor law did not apply in this particular case. There was no contract that was being renegotiated, so there were no there was no rules, there was no box that all of this fighting had to happen inside of. There were no three-minute rounds or whatever a boxing match would be, and judges and scoring. This just was going to be over when it was going to be over. There was some discussion among some of us about the best way to shut the company down. Because we felt that that was the only way we were going to get anybody's attention. Early on, um, probably the first two weeks, um, we would go to the Cracker Barrel almost every morning. And we would meet. They, would, they, would, they were nice to us. They loved us. And they would give us like a separate room so we wouldn't be overheard. Part of our strength was we didn't have a playbook. Oh, no, that was dumb. If it feels right, we'll do it. And if it doesn't work out, um, we'll think of something else. We decided that the best way to do this would be to shut down distribution and store support, which meant everybody in the office and all of the warehouses. And in that way, you would still have the stores open. They would still be getting the paycheck. You would affect the least amount of people, yet do the, the maximum amount of damage. We needed help. We needed help from media. We needed help from customers. And how are you going to make this happen unless you hit them in the wallet? Why did they fire us on a Sunday evening? That's just odd. I mean, I can understand sending a party because they don't have guts. But why, why on a Sunday afternoon? I'll tell you why. Because the board of directors must have called them this weekend and said, get this thing straightened out. 
Sorry, it's too late. We're shutting down. The CEOs, I mean, they were just out of their, their regular textbook, you know, of how to, how to run a company or what to do. I, I don't know what they expected, you know, the, uh, for this, the massive amount of people to stop working that did and then for this to shut down to happen. Key people have just been eliminated from the company. People that have dedicated their entire lives to making the company everything that it is. And you cast them aside like it's nothing. And you think that you're just going to throw those people out and then it's going to be business as usual? Really? You know, do, you, do you have a clue? Do you know anything about the company to begin with? We weren't taking orders, delivering, sending out orders for that day right there. I mean, it was done. But like I said, it was only two days by that Sunday. These stores were, you could see there's not other cases. In a week's time, the stores were bare. The new board came in. They still felt that they could get a team in there and they could and they could work this out because they had co-CEOs that supposedly had uh, experience that, that would, would help the new board. Uh, that was disputed uh, a lot by, by the rank and file of, of uh, market basket. I don't plan on working for Felicia Thornton and Jim Gooch in the future anyways, you know, because the way they're running the company, there'll be no company left to run. We got this new megaphone, everybody. We got it at Radio Shack. 75% off. Thank you, Gooch. Good for you. Thank you. But I think they really felt that they could, they could get the thing up and running again. And I think that's where... Uh, Certainly, one of the, the eight shareholders by the council said, hold it, uh, we don't believe that. This battle, which Arthur Estamula thought would be a one-on-one -on -one battle between his family and the other side of the family, then took on the front of associates, and then took on another front of customers and vendors. But the customers ended up carrying the day. We are here as customers, um basically boycotting Market Basket and putting more money into the pockets of corporate greed America. We're here picketing, rallying, and letting people of Market Basket and employees know that we're backing them up 100 percent The revolution is starting here, and we're going to finish this revolution as well. You want to say, Market Basket strong! <laughs> the idea of the customers boycotting was not our idea. I wish it were because it was brilliant. And, but that was as organic as anything in this. The customers did it. The customers asked us what to do, and we said, support us. And they said, you know what? We know what to do. We're not gonna shop there anymore. When those customers got involved, that was a game changer. You know, some, they didn't get involved because they were trying to save a few cents on a can of peas. They didn't get involved because Steve Polanka asked them to get involved. They got involved because of the cashier on Register 2 that they use every Tuesday morning at 9.45. The kid in the deli department, who knows, who knows Mary will take her uh, pre-sliced cheese, but you damn well better cut the ham thin as you can be. Because of the meat manager, who no matter how busy it is, stops to chat or because of the kid getting carriages every day, pulls and puts the same bags in for the same lady in the same spot every week. For the store manager, who's like the mayor of every town. They walked because it resonated with them. They stayed away because of the people. What is she here for? I came here to see you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did. I told Shirley, I said I haven't seen her. Yep. What would you do without Market Basket in your life, Mary? I would miss it terribly. How old are you? 70? 89. Oh, 89. Next well, year? You, you made I'm me mad at you. I'll, I'll, I know I made you mad at you. <laughs> I love you. Love you too, Mary. Everything's going to be good. I if it isn't, I'm going to have to move in. Wait a minute. <laughs> How many of you uh, in the audience tonight changed their shopping habits during this time? And I'm sure that many of you, I mean, based on 
dozens and maybe hundreds of people that we've, we've spoken with uh, say the same thing, which is exactly what Steve Planka said. Uh, people stop shopping in Market Basket because I actually of went inside and just the ones that were in there, I told them to get out. <laughs> <laughs> about this beforehand and I'm sure you found it with your book and, and we see it with the film it, it's very unusual that you wrote a book and people read it and most of the time even when it's nonfiction you're reading a book about something that happened to other people amazing things that other people did and in this case there's two million people who can honestly say that they were characters they were players and had a function in carrying this out. And there are very few stories where you have that many people who see themselves as stakeholders in, in a situation like that. That's right, that's right. And, and so many people uh, say that it, the reason why they did it was uh, because they wanted to support that person in the store that they knew that they saw every day. Maybe they didn't know the person by name, even, um, but they recognize them, they have a relationship with that person. And when they saw how committed they were, how committed uh, Cindy Whalen is, someone on her staff, how committed uh, Jim Fantini is, or any one of a, a dozen other vendors, uh, they wanted to support them as well. And a lot of people, a lot of people do um, kind of see this on their own, um, but it was, it was fascinating to see that there, the other side would be was an accusation that if you see fiduciary duty of a board member to be in the interest of the shareholders, then you could say the a shareholders or that, that other side of the board had a right. If that's your view of the world. But I don't even know if they knew that they were doing this, but they grabbed the narrative very early. And a lot of people came to this on their own, but they informed that base of two million people about what was going on, and they got their story out first. What was amazing was how the other side absolutely just decided not to engage, really, at almost nearly at all. Um, so that was that was very key. Is that they, they kind of got their story out and their side of it out first, and it resonated. Well, they had two PR firms, all right, the board and the uh, two CEOs had two of the highest priced, coming out of your grocery bill, um, <laughs> PR firms in the country, and you kicked their butt. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you think that they heard what you were doing? What, what, what was your sense of, uh, of their perspective on, on this protest that you were at the center of, Jim? Well, at, at the, I think we learned early on that they, Hurt us. I, I don't think they. I think they abstained from firing Arthur at that first board meeting because there was several thousand people outside that door, and they didn't want to run that gun. So early on, they hurt us. And then at the very next board meeting, they moved the location from Andover, Mass, to the Harvard Club, which screams market basket um, <laughs> in, in Boston. And when we all went there, we had another contingent go there. Well, what happened? They didn't even show up. They moved it when they heard that we were all going to be there to the 40-foot floor of the Prudential Building. So they heard us. They ran from us right from the start. Um, did we understand that they were actually hearing us or listening to us? No, we knew they weren't. But they were aware of what was going on, which makes it all the more sinful what they did. You know, they just turned a deaf ear to it all. How do you see, Cindy, those, the decisions that they were making? Uh, and you know, I mean, where we're, they're really putting your store in, in jeopardy. How, how, did they, how did you feel, see that as affecting your store in the day-to-day? -day? Uh... It was really affecting morale. I mean, a lot of people depend on that paycheck. And not only do they depend on the paycheck, they, they love coming to work and doing their job. They have this, this, this I call it like a family reunion every day, you know. You know um, and they were scared. <coughs> Um, at first, they were scared, um, and then that, and I did everything I could to try to figure out where we were going, and we were figuring it, like I said, it's organic, so every day the board did something, we acted, you know, um, 
So I did the best I could to get it down to them and explain to them because they needed to know. Um, and then, and then that fear just turned into anger, and just and, and and they fought. They were, and it really wasn't hard to get these. I'm like, if, if we're gonna win this, we're gonna need everybody on board. And um, I'll tell you that they would just come to me. They'd call me at my house. You know, can I sit down and talk to you? What should we be doing? You know, what's that email address for? You know, wrong wiener. What's you know. Um, ASDs, uh, should I write him an email? Absolutely, by all means, be professional. I always, that was always my thing. You know, like the dirty work to the, us, and uh, you know, but you guys be professional. What, uh, when you say that they, they, the morale took a hit uh, at various parts, what was the, what would you say, do you remember what the biggest hit was in that, during that time? The decision caused the biggest hit to morale? The, what they did? Um, the board's decision. Jeez, what would it have been? It was a lot, obviously. Um, yeah, the, well, the payout. Yes, exactly. Uh, the payout was a huge, huge. Um, uh, that was that was tough to explain away, and how we really going to recover from this. Um, what it cost? It was dividends. They they, dividends. they decided to um, to take a distribution of yeah. three hundred million dollars. Um, at their second board meeting after uh, after that initial one in July when we all engaged them, and then um, they voted as well a, a quarterly distribution going forward after that. So for the shareholders, yeah. yes. Well, all shareholders. Oh, everyone, everyone, everyone. No one would have benefited more. The largest shareholder was Arthur T. I mean, he didn't want it. So it was the other. Every shareholder would get. It. They controlled the board, so of course they'd all get that. Yes, we have a question. Did you here. Share The board, the board is made up of five. So there were three and two. There are each, there are the A and the B shareholders. Are the Arthur S. Mula side was the A shareholders. There the Arthur T. De Mula's family was the B shareholders. Two more. And then in the middle was a slate of three independents that were selected to serve as independents by the, whichever side had majority. So when the sister-in-law decided to jump from the B side to the A side, suddenly now they had 50 and a half percent, so they were able to name their own slate right. as independents. So it, it was seven at the time you accidentally said five, but there are five now. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, seven. Yeah, there are five currently. One of the key insights that, and we actually were able to interview one of the board members who was there before, during, and after, and one of the key insights that he gave was in, in executing this plan, they had, they had appointed these two new CEOs to, at least in the short term, keep the company running, keep it going. And what he related to us was that it seems like pretty early on, through a couple of A shareholders, there was acknowledgement with this revolt that was going on that many people thought, you know, how can they not be seeing what's going on here? That truly they, they recognized that these CEOs and this system was not going to be able to see it through um, to get the company operating, which begs the question that a couple of people, I remember Joe Schmidt had mentioned, he said, I would have had a lot more respect for the CEOs that were appointed by the board if they had come in, seen what happened, and seen what was going on, and said, you know what, you, know, you the board sold us a bill of goods, we didn't sign up for this, you know, we're out. But they didn't, and they stayed. And even after some of the shareholders had expressed concern with the idea that this is not going to work, it just continued to to go on from there. What do you see, Jim? It, the relationship between the the board at that time and those two replacement <coughs> CEOs, Alicia Thornton and Jim Gooch. How, how did you how did you see that relationship? Well, from your perspective, kind of. We've. I believe that the, the board was calling shots, you know, and certainly the shots of the board were being called by, in my opinion, Arthur S. And, you know, when they, like Tom said, on a Sunday afternoon, they send FedEx couriers to people's homes to fire them. Um, I don't believe that was the, the two replacement CEOs saying, let's, 
round up FedEx. I think they were told to straighten this thing out, send a message, fire a shot, do whatever you have to do. So I think the relationship was very simply uh, um, the puppeteers were in the boardroom or in, in the shareholder seat. So. Well, Jay, when you look at this from the, the board perspective, what do you see as uh, the lessons from your perspective? What have you learned about, about boards? What do you tell people now about how boards should behave? Well, my large company with its board of directors. <laughs> um, um, really, the lesson I took from that, I, before this story, I was under the impression that if you look at it objectively, that the role of a board of directors within a company is to what? Maximize shareholder value. That's probably number one, number two, and number three. And that's what we teach in and business. We, and we understand that. And I mean, we, people don't like how that exerts itself, but we understand that. And what we saw through this is this entirely different paradigm of stakeholder value. And um, the board member, Bill Shea, explains it you know, very well. That, and you, I'll let you explain it, but that that, that is actually not the, the, the core mission of a board, there are a host of stakeholders that include shareholders who are not to be minimized, but employees, you know, associates, vendors, the, the community. Um, so I was always under the impression, which is why you know you don't like a three hundred million dollar distribution, but if you look at the the model that I knew of a board, that's what they're supposed to do is maximize the benefit to the shareholders. Um, and yet you can run a highly profitable business by taking care of your employees, offering good service and low prices, and be profitable. Now, can you have absolute maximum profits? No, but if your goal is to run a sustainable company over the long term, um, then, you know, then that model isn't going to work. And most, most people within a company, most CEOs, aren't around for more than three to five years. So there's always this sort of short exit plan of how to do it. Um, this company is now into its third generation and probably onto its fourth. So it's a bit of an outlier, but I think a lot of people are, are learning from this model. And then what Jay was alluding to before was the, the legal uh, responsibility of the board of directors. Because um, we do, and you know, I say this all the time to my classes, um, I, this is what I, what I learned in undergrad, in business school, when I did my MBA, when I did my PhD. Um, I was always taught that the, the role of the board is to protect the interests of the shareholders, and that's it. There's a lot of work coming out now. Uh, Lynn Stout of Cornell Law is probably the best person um, that's looking at this research. She's looked at the corporate code in every state in the country, and there is not a state in the country that says that the responsibility is to the shareholders. Um, it's incredible, right? Um, the responsibility of the board of directors is to the interests of the corporation. Full stop. In Massachusetts, that's it, the corporation. Now we look at this company, we see store directors, we see vendors, we see two million customers, many of whom are in the room right now, uh, all saying we want to keep this company the way it is. And then we have a group, a small group of shareholders uh, that takes control and they, they tell the board, no, we want, we want to pull these, extract these profits and sell the company. Um, in my view, they, they really, the, the board dropped the ball in this case uh, in a big way, uh, they dropped their responsibility. Uh, they were not looking after the corporation. I think it's very hard to argue that they were looking after the interests of the entire corporation in this case. Uh, but uh, anyway, they, they do, the board does have tremendous legal leeway uh, to do what they feel is right. Uh, but, legal, but also, legally, their responsibility is to all of us. To the broad corporation. Uh, to, the, to the health of the broader corporation. Uh, I think there's a quick question over here. Yep. Uh, yeah, my name's Jerry. Does everything you said hold for private as well as publicly funded corporations? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that is correct. And, and I think it was Jim. Jim, I just want to make a comment. Uh, my wife and I have shopped at all the supermarkets in Manchester, because uh, we, we were born and we still live here. 
Um, and we find um, Hanford and the Moolahs, or Market Basket, pretty much on par, mm -hmm. right? We don't much care for Shaw's, and Stop and Shop is gone, but the other two, I think, are, are pretty good. And like you said, um, Hanford was sold, I think, to a French company, a French conglomerate a long time ago. We didn't notice very much difference, and the Hanfords are still around, and people still kept their jobs. So I think there's, there's a lot of speculation on what might have happened had the Moolahs been sold. I, mean, I think we want to be careful about you know, reaching some conclusions that may not be as accurate as they might have been. Sure, that's fair. Uh, absolutely. Hanford's a great competitor as well. They always have been. Um, but that unknown is, is, when you have a known, which is the way this company has been run, and you have the unknown of, uh, and this I don't think certainly was on people's, the front of their mind. It was more on mine because I know the way my company's dealings would have changed. Um, but when you have a publicly traded company, the, the, the start and stop is the quarterly earnings report. And that would have fundamentally changed everything about market basket, no doubt about it. So would you have felt it right away? Would you have felt it down the road? I don't know. But certainly the associates would have felt it and the profit share. And that would have been, I don't think that would have stayed intact in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, that's speculation, but I, I think it's grounding some pretty firm reality that you would have become part of something so much bigger and therefore you're that much smaller. And the store managers, I don't know how that works as far as the store that you shop in, but I'm gonna guess that it's, it's not the same people all the time in there. It's, it's just a different way to run a business. And that was very real to people that we didn't want it. So it's not to say that it's bad for everybody. For Hannaford's, they're, they're still a great competitor, always were, but it wasn't, right for market basket to go that way. And people really believe that as evidenced by everything that happens. So one, of the, one, of the, one of the observations that I made, I'm the editor of Tom Bennett, the editor, the editor of the film, and I've been watching hundreds of hours of this stuff and listening to interviews and things like that. One of the observations that I've made is that what, made, what makes Market Basket what it is, is the culture. And the culture flows from the family, it flows from Arthur T, it flows from that set of values. You take that set of values out of the equation, and I think you would have seen, quite certainly, a, a deterioration of that that whole ecosystem that, that grew up around it. And and frankly, that, yeah. I, will, I will agree with that 100%, because I used to work for Digital Equipment Corporation. Some of you know about that company. And when it was no longer Digital Equi Equipment Corporation, which was not a fun place to work, uh, you know, we kept getting pushed around, things kept changing, and my job went to India. So I know what the culture of a good corporation, especially a Massachusetts corporation, is. And when you change that culture, things do fall apart. And your point is well taken um, about the speculation. I think more of the reason why it's informed speculation, and, and a lot of people may not know it, but to take the profit sharing plan, Market Basket in some of those places really is an outlier to the way things work today. And when you take uh, the bonus system that they have, plus the idea that above and beyond your pay for full-timers every year, 15%, somewhere between 15 and 20%, is put into a fund for your retirement above and beyond, above and beyond your wage, like not a 401k, but, a, but basically a pension plan. And you can also draw on that if it's to buy a house or something like that. Um, that is such an outlier that I think it's pretty fair to say that that would have changed significantly. Um, also, not that, the not that the acquiring company is evil, you know what I mean, but that's just not the way business is done. If we go back, if we go back to the stress of the day when, you were in, when we were in it, uh, in August, let's say, of, of 2014, that was almost like the lesser of the evils. If we weren't going to win this thing and Arthur T wasn't going to get it back, Hannaford was almost the, okay, we're going to be that, but we really believe that the real estate was going to be sold, that the company was going to be broken up. You know, we didn't see that as a, I guess we, we, we thought for a little while there that it might be them, but I, I think we, more than anything, thought that we were all going to be broken up. This place was going to be strip mined to, uh, right down to the core. And real quick, the other thing that we did find out from one of the, the board members was, you know, I was kind of curious, like, how close was this? You know, it's only six weeks. A lot of, a lot of labor situations go on for months, for years. And he basically validated the fact that 
at a certain point, if you went in from week six to week seven, um, that it wasn't really even a matter of could these two sides come to an agreement. The company had been so compromised in terms of it financially that um, that it couldn't get financed. So these, these guys could hammer out an agreement all they wanted, but as you went into that seventh week, it was going to become almost impossible to get financing for any kind of a deal, and then the whole thing just begins to spiral. You want to get to, uh, to more questions. I just want to ask um, Cindy, what's your perspective now when, when you look and, and hear about the board? Um, how, how, do you, how would you characterize how they're, it's functioning now? It's, it's now five members instead of seven. Uh, do, you, do, you, uh, do you get a sense of how they're doing? Well, clearly they're doing just fine. Uh, because, you know, I, I'm not writing emails at the moment about that kind of fighting or anything. But, um, you know, obviously they were handpicked by um, our side of the family. And, um, so, and they're functioning as they should. You know, and, um, and, you know, the CEO is doing his job. And um, the company is well. We're back to opening stores. Um, and, and I know that they are making all the right decisions um, for the corporation as a whole. And it thinks about the stakeholders and the longevity of this company. It's basically uh, these. It's not about, as people say, short-term gain. You know, they're, they're just, we're in it now for the long haul. The people in place, they're, they're going to see do what needs to be done to make this company, you know, go to the fifth and sixth generation. As far as let's take a thirty-second clip of uh, Bill Shea and uh, to give you a good idea of their philosophy now going forward. Real quick, Bill Shea sort of lays out his view what the what the proper role of the board is and how it operates for, for market basket. The role of a board of directors has you know, emerged at, at market basket in my mind to be way more of a stakeholder uh, type of role where everyone matters. All all stakeholders, not just not just shareholders. And the way that market basket works is well, all stakeholders uh, share in, in the value system of, of market basket and they share in the rewards of market basket. And at the end of the day, uh, profit profit will be will be fine. Profit will be understood by the state stakeholders and uh, they they share in developing the bottom line, which they're very proud of. And they do it because they're included in decision making, and that's the way the, the board and, and I has run this thing. He talks about that all the time. We have this many stakeholders, and they're all different kinds. This this the city city mayors, there are people that run construction companies, they are they're people that sell flowers, they're all different types of people. And it's broader than employees, it's broader than customers. And when you break it all down and and you put it all together in the right way, where everyone feels like they've contributed, the bottom line takes care of itself. So I think we see a, a company where the board now is really looking at the company as a, as a system of people working together. Uh, when, when, boards, when boards lose sight of how the company works, we get into crises like we, like we saw. Uh, and uh, in this case, it happens that two million people fought back and took back this company. Uh, but it, it's a, it's really a very clear case of a company of a of a board uh, losing its way in in my view. Um, and now they have a much uh, a much different way uh, of doing things. I, let's take take some questions. Sure, sir. Company took on debt to uh, get about the tea back. How come they didn't go to the customers instead of going to the shocks? A lot of customers would have contributed for a lower interest rate, a dividend that the shocks are demanding. And also, the company would probably have shown the appreciation through the years that the people that would have advanced them the money they needed. Well, in my opinion, and I'm not a financial expert, but um, I have heard that Believe it or not, we have an incredible interest rate um, on the, the debt. Um, it's already been reworked once, and it's it's not 
I wouldn't call them sharks. Um, I don't know. No, no. But that's just, I'm not going to speak on it, but it's not, no, it's not that high. And, uh, and Akati would never put that burden on, on the people he's been trying to protect. Um, it, it, was a, it was hard enough for him to ask, you know, to go outside and to put his company into debt. It, it probably played heavily on, um, it goes against everything he knows. We've never been in debt before. So it was a very tough decision for him. And in my opinion, um, this debt, you know, one of my favorite quote, he's back there, another store director said, this is our debt. Um, and he said it, and we, it's, it is our debt. And we're, and we're gonna, we're helping in every way we can to be more profitable, you know, keeping costs down. We, we, we focus on everything now. I mean, I, I'm, every piece of paper goes into the recycling bin rather than the trash can. That's Not how paper it's towels in the men's room, you know. You know, it's so, you know, probably the extreme of most people, but no, I, I honestly believe that, and, and again, I can't speak, but I know our interest rate um, is a, a damn good one. What I understand of it, too, that it's, there's no private equity involved, it's all banks. So the sharks are minimizing the fact that banks are private equity, so they're keeping their nose out of it, as far as I understand, as far as the day-to-day -day operations of the company goes as well. Well, we know from the public record is that they're, uh, they're quite a bit ahead of schedule on paying, paying down the debt, and the goal is to go to zero again, as it was before. And we've all been told is that rule number one is he does not want the customer to feel this. You know, everybody was rightfully skeptical that if a company that's operated without debt is part of its, in, in, integral part of its culture, suddenly takes on enormous debt, who's gonna feel it? Uh, I mean, the, the customers all had the right to feel and probably felt, okay, fine. Right? You don't give your 4% anymore. Well, of course. Now that was a wonderful bonus for a year, right? Wasn't it? See, that's it was so, that was a an amazing um, and almost gift from the company for the customers for their loyalty for the patronage over all the years. To almost have twelve months of a of, of something like that, and it, yeah, I mean, rightfully it had to end at some point. Sure. And to be fair, I mean, I've gotten emails and correspondences from people who loyal customers stood out there and held a sign, and they think that prices have gone up. Now, the counter argument to that is that, in particular food areas, prices have gone up everywhere, but they maintain um, that, you know, there may have been a little bit of a spike in prices. I, I don't know if that's, you know, true or not. I still get my two jugs of iced tea for two for $4, but um, that, that is something that some people I, as a customer, yes, your prices have gone down, yeah. but so has inflation. Right. And have they had other places? Of course. All right. right. So, so right. that tells you it's probably market driven. Yeah. I can tell you, um, like I said, I'm a member of the family, but let's not lose sight. I'm a vendor. Yeah. And uh, so I'm treated like the dreaded stepchild member of the family. So <laughs> we get the squeeze. You know, I know, I know where they're pushing hard to cut some of the costs. And it is. It is almost set in stone. There's no sign on the building, but it is set in stone there to do whatever you can to not let the customers feel this debt. Jim wouldn't let me shoot him for the first half of this crisis because he was really out on a limb with his own employer about how far into this rebellion he was. I mean, if there was Adams, Washington, and Jefferson, he was one of them. And it was only about halfway through where he's like, I, I, I reconciled it with my employer. You know, if I happen to appear on camera, that's fine. But that goes back to important. the, you know, I worked, yeah. I left my family's business 15 years ago, and I went to work with LePage Bakeries out of Maine, which makes the proud label, which is a wonderful, was a family-run business for almost 100 years. And then we were bought by a, a national company. Now we're part of the second largest baking company in America. And so that dynamic changes. It's still a wonderful place to work, but it's a very different place to work. So... And they were much. They would be much more cautious about. <clears throat> I was told very strictly, do not let us ever see your face or your name in print. We have a question in the back there. Thank you. Um, thank all of you. I'm a faculty here, and so it's great to have this kind of discussion on our campus. I remember day 50 of the slowdown, strike, shutdown. I don't know what term to apply to it, since it does kind of go outside all the boxes we currently have for labor relations, but. On that day, I was interviewing um, 
a pretty high level CEO for a column that I write and um, the look of terror that crossed that individual's face thinking about what their own company would be like after 50 days um, and whether there would be a company and the fear and, and what struck me being somebody who focuses on organizational behavior um, does that experience this is you know we all cheered we raised our hands and we, we stopped shopping um, we have this really warm re response to how it's sorted itself out um, but remembering that look that I saw on that CEO's face does it does it change how people conduct themselves when they're in those leadership roles do you not want to become RDT do you not want to be so beloved that your entire company could be erased because of how strongly people feel to work with you so I'm curious from each of your perspectives, is that something that um, you've heard or fear you've seen or how it's been playing out within the company itself? I think it's the elemental question of the whole thing. And I've said that to a couple of some friends of mine who are business leaders. If you were fired, would your employees and associates applaud, not care, or would they fight for you? Would they do anything to try to fight for you? Now, we can't expect. I mean, this really was an unusual situation. Um, but it does probably make you a little more mindful about what would their response be to you being compromised in some way. Um, and I think that's, you know, and I think the other thing too is the lessons that you learn from this, I think they're really hard and I think they should be really hard. Um, you know, I was hit a couple of times with, so what are the three points that, that, that you know, if you want to run your company like a mar more like a market basket, what, what are the three bullets? Because that's how we do everything. And I'm like, it's not, you can't do that. It's like turning around a cruise ship. You have to adopt a certain set of values and then you have to wait 20 years <laughs> for it be, to really begin to pay off. Um, and I, that's, you know, that's kind of the bottom line. So it's, it's a, it's a wonderful story. It, 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 it allows people to ask questions of CEOs as to how would they respond to you, but it's also not something where there's a quick fix. One way that I'd like to describe it also is that you know, Arthur T is at the center of this. Uh, I see him as, as he became a symbol really of, of the company. So the central demand of this protest was we need to have Arthur T back. Right? That was the demand. But when you really look carefully of what people were fighting for. Uh, he's an important part of the picture, he's central, uh, but there's more to it than that. There's more, there, people are fighting for this culture, as Tom was, was bringing up. They're fighting for this company and institution that they've known for years, that they've, they're, they've had in their family for generations. Uh, and I find, I think that to me is something that is that companies should be striving for. And I think there's been some impugning of the idea that, well, they were fighting for their own self-interest. They were fighting for their jobs. Those leaders were trying to get people lower on the scale. The management was trying to get labor lower on the scale to give up their jobs for their own self-interest. And I think that sets up a false choice because if you can fight for your own self-interest, your own uh, profit sharing plan, your own wage and your own job, and be fighting for something broader than that as well. It's not a zero-sum game. It's what's great. I mean, it, part of the greatness of this whole story is people rallying together for a common cause. And I think Daniel said it perfectly. Arthur was, in a sense, the flag we, we rallied around and that we carried forward. But he embodied that culture, and that's what everyone fought for. And any CEO should embrace the people that work with him, not for him, but the people that work with him, to love the company that they work for, and that he carries forward what they are helping him build and, and grow with. So yeah, it's not the man per se, he was a great CEO, but if he was just a good CEO, or just an average CEO, or a bad CEO, but the, co the, the culture of the company was ever jeopardized by him, it wouldn't be for him. It, this was a battle for something much bigger, that, but he's also walked the walk as his dad walked the walk with it. And you know, we fought everybody together in a way that it can only happen, I think, in New England, um, for a company and a culture, and not a man. 
And I think there's a little bit of a myth, real quick. After the fact, you know, you see some of the associates and employees, and they're like, we won, and we sent them back. And, you know, we won, and we told them, you know, hit the road. Well, everyone was going to win, or everyone was going to lose. And those who were sent, I mean, if, if you could send me and a couple people packing with $1.5 billion, I'll go anywhere you want. But the idea is that the other side, in a way, got what they had been looking for all along, which was sort of a liquidation event, was to, to, to get out and to get their money. So everybody kind of won, in a way, including the, the customers and everyone else, or everybody really could have lost. <clears throat> One more question we've got. Yes? What is Market Basket doing, doing now to protect themselves from something like this in the future? Benefit Corporation? I mean, any of that sort of? No, uh, the company is, is set up, I believe, in, in the way that it always has been. I'm not privy to exactly how it's set up, but there's a, we have one family that has ownership of it. There's a trust in that family, certainly, that from the, the workforce, that they've always looked out for them. They haven't altered the profit sharing plan. They haven't altered the bonus structure. In fact, they've enhanced it, from what I understand. Um, so I think it goes back to the trust and the culture. That the family that owns it now, outright, um, has the, the right interests of the people in mind doing everything that they do in the board. And I think we have the right board members in there to make sure that it's governed properly, to keep that mandate in mind, that it's a company for the stakeholders. Right, but there's no sister in law anymore. So now it's all blood, it's, it's, a, it's a brother and three sisters. And again, coming from the family business, it doesn't matter, I, I, don't, I think family business is the hardest thing in the world because you put money into a family, and then you get married, and things happen. And um, I, I left mine because it was too hard. And it, will it be smooth? No. But they are the ones who govern the business. It is a board set up. And with a man like Mr. Shea and Terry Carlton, who was a board member, uh, and is still a board member, and he was a board member through all of this, these are people who understand the culture of the company. We have our faith in them that they will always have the best interest of the company, and will be able to work through and settle the issues, any issues that come up before it affects the company. Just don't go self-checkout. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was happy to see that uh, you know, some, some companies have a CEO on the board. Um, in this case, they decided not to do that. I thought that was a, um, that was, that was a proper thing to do, and, and I think it's in the direction that you're, that you're speaking about. Uh, in terms of benefit corporations, it wouldn't quite cover this. I don't know how many of you, uh, of you are uh, uh, familiar with this, it's a setup of a type of corporation, all benefit corporation, uh, where it gives certain specific rules to boards, certain specific responsibilities that push more towards the share, uh, stakeholders um, than others. Um, in this case, they elected not to do that, and, um, and I, I think continuing in the way that they, they uh, have been is probably the best, uh, the, the most stable way to go forward. There's a gentleman that we interviewed as well who suggests that the next level, and he, he maintains that it can happen at this size of a company, one possibility is employee ownership. There are companies this big that do become employee owned. So take a stakeholder and put a capital S on that. You know, if if it became if a company like this becomes a, an employee owned company. All right. I think we're uh, we're going to have to wrap up. We're going to take uh, we'll take questions after I think individually since we're uh, we're running low on time here. I'd like to give the last word to Jay. Do you have any parting words for us? I just, you know, a year after the fact, um, there's, you know, people, one uh, media person I was talking to was like, are, are people still interested in this story? And I think one of the great things about this story is that there is so, so much to learn from it and so much to mine from it. And uh, it's so great to see such a, a, a group of people here, uh, you know, still interested and still wanting to learn from, uh, from what happened. And so thank you for coming out, and uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for coming.